for the remainder of our time then. Let us return to 1 Samuel chapter 20, to that long chapter that we have read. The chapter may well be divided into four sections. We have David before Jonathan, verses 1 to 11. And then we have the pair in the field from verses 11 to 23. And then we have Jonathan along with others at the table with King Saul from verses 24 to 34. And then we have the pair, David and Jonathan, back at the field, verses 35 to 42. We may well be wondering what can we make of uh, this chapter this evening, this long chapter. Well, the title I want to give to our meditation tonight is Covenant Security. Covenant security. For this chapter here speaks about the covenant that David and Jonathan joyfully entered into and how they were at pains to make sure that each would keep their part of that covenant. And it is a a wonderful chapter here that shows a tremendous amount of love between the two brethren here. Jonathan, Saul's son, who stood to gain everything to succeed Saul, but he recognized that in the will of the Lord that was not to happen. David was going to be the one who would be the, the king and Jonathan hoped that he might be second in command. And David at this time was a, a fugitive. Although he had been anointed by the prophet Samuel, yet because of Saul's jealousy, he was hated and despised and hunted down because Saul recognized that ultimately, unless he killed him, David would have the kingdom. And it's good for us to <coughs> remind ourselves of the background. After David had slain Goliath and he had won the wholehearted approval of all the people of Israel, that Jonathan entered into a covenant with him. I'm going to reread a couple of verses that we read some time ago from 1 Samuel chapter 18 that reminds us that Jonathan entered voluntarily into a covenant with David. You'll find it in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verses 3 and 4 where we read after Jonathan had um, welcomed David and congratulated him, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And there we might recognize that Jonathan voluntarily recognized that David was the Lord's anointed and that Jonathan was going to accept the will of God his father would not, but Jonathan would. He was prepared to give up everything. That's what he did. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Could indeed be applied to what Jonathan did on that occasion. He surrendered his kingship and gave it to David and entered into a a covenant with him. And David in verse 20, verse 8 of the uh, chapter that we just read, David reminds Jonathan of this covenant. Therefore, verse 8, thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant 
for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. And we find here too that Jonathan calls upon David to make a covenant. In verses 14 to 17 of the chapter we read, Jonathan says in verse 14, And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again, because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. So there we have the background to this, this chapter here. To these two gracious men, these two men who were believers, voluntarily entered into a covenant and they invoked the name of the Lord to bless and to bless that covenant in order that they might keep it. Jonathan was prepared to give up everything because he recognized it was the will of God and he recognized it would be better for him to acquiesce as it were and to go along with God's will rather than be like his father who sought to overturn the will of the Lord. And David, for his part, he entered into a covenant and he promised that he would do good to Jonathan and to his house. Now that might seem obvious to us, but in the time and in the day that David lived in, when a new king took over, it was customary for the king to slaughter all the, the relatives of the king that he succeeded in order that he might establish his kingdom. That was the normal pattern in these days. You would destroy any kind of possible opposition. You would not let them live. But David was not of that ilk. He entered into a covenant with Jonathan and with his household, guaranteeing that he would be good to them when David would ultimately be uh, the king. Well, we want to say <coughs> four things from uh, this long chapter here. And we want to meditate upon the fact that we're looking here at covenant security. And we want to try to apply this to ourselves ourselves here today this evening and I have sought to draw four things from this chapter to help us to understand something of covenant theology we are a branch of the church that does believe in covenant theology and what that simply means is we believe that God works through covenant and if we want to delve into this matter it's a wonderful subject that warms the heart when we recognize that salvation is not in any sense a loose matter it is something that god has determined in his covenant theologians talk about a covenant of peace a covenant of peace and that's a covenant that took place in eternity past between God the Father and God the Son, where they entered into what is called the covenant of redemption. A glorious covenant that the Father and the Son, the two parties in the covenant entered into, and whereby the the Son took upon himself to come to this world and to suffer and to die for his people in order that they might be brought to eternal life and eternal bliss. And that covenant of redemption, it manifests itself in the covenant of grace 
the covenant of grace that began to be revealed and unveiled to mankind on that day when our first parents fell into sin. Because not long after they fell into sin, they got that glorious promise that the Saviour would come, one who would crush the head of Satan. And you'll find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And throughout the Old Testament, this covenant of grace, that is, the, if you like, the flip side of the covenant of redemption, that covenant of grace that, is, that has been revealed to mankind was slowly being revealed. He revealed part of it to Noah after the flood. And then, of course, it was revealed to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. It was further revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai. It was revealed to David when he was promised that a king would come from his loins. And, of course, that king was ultimately to be the saviour. God deals with us in a covenant. And today he deals with us in the covenant of grace. Well, four things then we might look at as we go through this chapter. The first thing we would notice <coughs> for our edification, I trust, is the covenant security in uncertainty. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm referring really to the first part of the chapter when I say covenant security in uncertainty. David was living in perilous times and he was uncertain. He was not uncertain regarding Saul. He knew exactly what Saul's intents were. Saul intended to kill him. David was clear about this matter, but he was uncertain. He was unclear as to why Saul wanted to kill him. Jonathan, for his part, he was unclear. He did not realize that Saul truly wanted to end the life of David. He says, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. So here we have confusion. But in amongst this confusion, these two gentlemen had entered into a covenant. Yes, it was man-made. It was made in the name of the Lord. But nevertheless, the two of them were faithful to the covenant. And even although they were unsure and living in uncertain times and they didn't know everything, yet they knew the relationship between themselves was sure and steadfast. Yes, Jonathan was not aware of Saul's true intentions. And David couldn't understand why Saul wanted to kill him, although he was sure Saul did want to kill him. But all of this was covered in uncertainty. Yet the covenant was sure. It was absolutely secure. We can apply this to ourselves. We can understand this as having relevance to ourselves. You know, friends, God has entered into a covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that covenant is sure and steadfast. And although indeed the whole host of hell might be against the people of God and there may be uncertainty in the lives of individuals and they may, may not be able to see light at the end of the tunnel and their lives may well truly be in some sense uncertain humanly speaking as far as they are concerned yet nevertheless because of that covenant security because of that glorious eternal covenant that the Father and the Son have entered into, the salvation of his people is absolutely certain and cannot in any sense be overthrown. Oh, that we would understand this. Believers, we'll get times of uncertainty. We will get times of doubt. 
We will get times of despair and times of disappointment. But this fact that God has entered into a covenant with his son and his son has fulfilled all the obligations of that covenant should indeed convince us that indeed our salvation is sure. It is certain. Not because of us. Not because of what we have done. But because of the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we would notice from this chapter, we have here uncommon faithfulness shown in the covenant. Uncommon faithfulness shown. And we find this from verses 12 uh, to 17. <coughs> Jonathan was prepared to give up everything. We might not think much of that. But he did. He loved David that much that he was prepared to take off his garments. And of course, that was symbolic. He was recognizing that David was ultimately God's anointed and God's choice to be the king. And that God was going to bypass Solomon, uh, Jonathan. He was going to be, in some sense, rejected. This is not easy for flesh and blood. But John was a hum uh, Jonathan was a humble individual, a believer who believed in the Lord his God and was, was prepared to go along with, with whatever the Lord had for him, believing that ultimately the Lord's will is best and he is to acquiesce in that. Do we not have here a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? Does this not shine some light upon the, the humiliation and the condescension of Christ? We might think about and speak about him coming from heaven. But we're really speaking about something we really know nothing about. Other than the fact that heaven is a glorious place. The Apostle Paul, who was the most exercised Christian known to us, he knew something of heaven, the third heaven. And what he experienced there, he was not able to comprehend or to communicate to us. Such was its glory. Such was its surpassing glory. He was dumbstruck when he entered into that experience. And yet here we have the eternally begotten Son of God, the one who was worshipped and adored in heaven, the one who knew the Father intimately, who had glorious fellowship with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, where he dwelt in perfect unity and harmony, and he came to this barren and the sin-cursed world. He did, in some sense, empty himself. Oh no, he never emptied himself of his deity. That would be absolutely impossible. But his deity was veiled. It couldn't be seen. It was hidden in the flesh. He was no different from any other individual. And he cast aside and laid aside all of that, friends, in order that he might be able to undertake and work out a salvation for us. All of this was necessary. He became a man of sorrows and he was acquainted with grief and he knew it all the days that he, he moved upon this world until it culminated at Gethsemane when he sweated great drops of blood. As the covenant requirements were laid upon him. You see, he had to suffer. He had to die in order to save us, in order to fill that covenant of redemption. He had to take upon himself our form and nature 
in order that he might suffer. And this is what he was so willing to do. We talk about these things. We seek to preach about these things. But oh, we need to grasp them more and more and to see and to appreciate all that Jesus Christ willingly and voluntarily undertook in order to save his people. And here we have an uncommon faithfulness that someone was prepared to cast aside his kingship for another. That's what Jesus did in some extent. He cast aside everything in order to save his people. Do you think then after showing all of this that for those whom he has died for that they shall perish? Impossible. Absolutely impossible. This is to encourage us, believer. This is to fortify us. And this is to encourage others that they might come and avail themselves of this salvation that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because some people, they might consider the, the Christian way the hard way. They might consider, oh, they could never keep this it up, as it were. He is the Saviour. He saves. He saves to the absolute uttermost. I know I have said this to you before, but it's well worth repeating. Can you describe the uttermost? Can you define the uttermost? He is able to save unto the uttermost. Will he lose any? If he can save to the uttermost? No. Impossible. Not only has he provided atonement. Not only has he done all that was required to, to have our sins forgiven. But he even now sits at God's right hand. Where he makes intercession for his people on the basis of his atonement. Impossible. Absolutely impossible for those who truly come to the Lord Jesus Christ and have him as their Lord and Saviour that they should perish. Moving on thirdly, covenant demands costly commitment. We find this in verses 24 to 34. The covenant demands costly commitment. And here we find Jonathan shining again. Jonathan was one who really didn't know how much his father hated David. Until he came to the feast, David was absent the first day. His father didn't make any comment on his absence on that day. But the second day, David was absent again and the story came out. David had asked to be excused. He was going to a feast in Bethlehem. Saul turned on his son, said some things that were utterly terrible for any father to say to his son. Jonathan knew then without any shadow of a doubt that Saul hated David and that David and that Saul was out to kill him at any opportunity. And as Jonathan sought to defend David, he himself became the subject of Saul's anger. To such an extent that Saul was going to kill him. See what happens. David was absent from 
the feast, his seat was empty. But by the end of the day, Jonathan's seat was empty. He was gone. And Jonathan really nailed his colours to the mast on that occasion. And he committed himself publicly to David and to his cause. And he sided with David. He cast aside his father at this time. It cost him. It truly cost him to side with David. For all would know that Jonathan was on David's side and not his father's. This reminds us of a couple of things. It again reminds us of the commitment of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did everything to secure the salvation of his people. Nothing was left undone. Nothing whatsoever. He fulfilled the law of God perfectly. This is what theologians call his active obedience, whereby he actively fulfilled the law of God. And friends, when we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, his active obedience is given to the believer. It's imputed to the believer. And not only that, not only did he did he perform all that the law required, but he bore the penalty that the law required. You see, Adam and all of us in Adam have sinned, and the law requires that we pay the penalty of breaking the law of God. And what is it? It's death itself. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He suffered and he died. He paid the penalty of the law. And this is what theologians call his passive obedience. And we need both of these things. His active obedience whereby he actively obeyed and perfectly fulfilled the law of God. And his passive obedience where he paid the ultimate price for that law that has been broken. Death itself. It also reminds us of what's required of us. We are to take up our cross and to follow the Lord Jesus. We are to take it up daily. We are to deny self. Is that not what Jonathan did here? He sided with David, who was an outcast. Sided with David, who was under the threat of death. Yet, he was willing to be aligned with him and to cast his back upon his father and that kingdom. And when we consider all that Jesus Christ undertook for his people, how he was willing to be identified with sin in order to save his people. Surely then we are willing to take up the cross. Surely we are willing to be identified with him. Surely we are not ashamed of him and his words. Surely friends we recognize that the covenant that he entered into demanded of him costly obedience. And in response, there will be occasions when it demands costly commitment by his people also. Well, fourthly, <coughs> the fourth thing we want to notice from this chapter is that the covenant provides peace in the middle of confusion. Verse 42, for instance, and Jonathan said to David, after everything be became clear to Jonathan and to David, go in peace. 
for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord. David was going to be an outcast. He was going to be running from Saul. <clears throat> His life would be very uncertain in many ways. He didn't know how he was going to get on. He was going to be a fugitive, but he was going to know peace. He was going to have peace with Jonathan. The two of them were going to honor the covenant that they had made between each other. And whatever David had to worry about, he didn't have to worry about Jonathan's actions. He knew that ultimately Jonathan was for him. And Jonathan, on his part, would be able to put trust in David and he would know that David would not be out and against him because of the covenant that they had both entered into. And in, in amongst all this confusion, David principally would know peace, the peace of that covenant. But there's nothing that brings more peace <coughs> To the child of God to know that the covenant of the Lord is upon him. And that covenant gives him peace. We could think of that verse in Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. In amongst all the change that was happening in Malachi's day, when many people were abandoning the covenants that they had made with their wives, for instance, here the Lord was thundering through the prophet. In amongst all that changes, he was saying, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. If I was to be like yourselves, he was saying in some respects, if I was to be like yourselves, you would perish. I would break my covenant. But no, I'm not like that. I'm a God who has entered into a covenant and that covenant cannot be broken. I will keep my side of the covenant. And because of that, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And is this not the comfort for the Christian? We'll have our days when we are faithful, but we'll have our days when we will be backslidden. We will have our days when we are not as faithful as we should be. We will have our days when we're not full of zeal. We will have our days when there's no love in our hearts towards the Lord Jesus Christ. But God does not break his covenant. He is sure. He is steadfast. Of course, this is not a license to sin. This is not a license to live lightly. It's a, but it's a great comfort to the Christian to know that his salvation does not ultimately rest upon himself, but it rests upon the living God and that glorious, wonderful, unbreakable, eternal covenant that he has entered into with his Son. And we bless God that his son has fully met all the demands of that covenant. And therefore the people of God shall be brought to glory. And although they may have times of trouble and tribulation, yet they will know peace as David was to know. I love these verses. In John, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was speaking to his people. He had just healed a man who had been born blind. And because this man gave glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, the man who had been born blind, who now saw, was thrown out of the temple. He was thrown out of the house of God. He was thrown out of the means of grace because he recognized that Jesus had opened his eyes and he was prepared to acknowledge that he was the Messiah. And the scribes and the Pharisees threw him out. And Jesus said afterwards, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me 
and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which give them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Can you see the context, friends? Can you see what Jesus is saying? Men can throw you out of the church. Men can excommunicate you. They can do all that. But they cannot take you out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's impossible. Once you have come to him truly, savingly, once he is your Lord and Savior, he will always be your Lord and Savior. Does this not indeed comfort you? Does it not encourage you? Does it not inspire you to seek the Savior? Oh, friends, we have a, a glorious gospel. Why have we got a glorious gospel? Because we have a glorious Savior, an absolute glorious Savior, the one who has entered into a covenant met all its demands and who will ultimately save his people. I'm going to close with a quotation from Isaiah. Isaiah 54 again reminding us of the faithfulness of God. From verse 7 to verse 10 of Isaiah 54 for a small moment have I forsaken thee but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. What a glorious, what a wonderful security belongs to God's people. I hope you know it. You can only know it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come unto him. Avail yourselves of him and know that covenant firsthand and know that covenant security. Amen. And may God bless his word to us. Let us pray together.